started this morning. Um, thank you all for joining us. I am Kristen Craig, president of the Terre Haute Chamber of Commerce. I'm really excited, uh, timing-wise, to be doing this update today. Uh, there's several initiatives that are happening right now at the state level that I think this in information we're going to be discussing from the Indiana Chamber is especially relevant to. So I'm anxious to hear the thoughts that our friends, um, Kevin Bringar, president and CEO of the Indiana Chamber, and Adam Barry, who is, um, let's see, vice president of Economic Development and Technology will be joining us here in a few minutes to share some insights and updates from their Indiana Vision 2025 plan. But before we jump into that, I did want to kind of set the stage a little bit for some things that are happening locally and regionally in Terre Haute, Vigo County in the West Central area. So as many of you may know, in late 2019, the Terre Haute Chamber, we kind of stepped out of our typical chamber role, so to speak, um, and unveiled the CU and Terre Haute Community Plan. I see one of the co-chairs of that endeavor on the call with us today, Steve Holman, CEO of Union Health Group, and Mayor Duke Bennett was the other individual who really stepped up alongside us and, and helped us bring that plan into fruition. Um, the plan was really based on comprehensive research, a um, robust community Community survey and existing, existing information gathered from over 40 organizations. Um, the main two tenets of our plan, which will probably sound pretty familiar to the Indiana Chamber folks, uh, were halting population decline and reversing the trend of declining per capita personal income. Um, the entire premise of the plan is what we as a community can come together and accomplish also by the year 2025. And since then, since its inception a couple of years ago, six teams of community leaders have been working towards moving these metrics. Um, and just to kind of give you a brief recap of what they've been able to accomplish, despite having to do a lot of their work uh, during a pandemic, is that they've been able to engage a dynamic team of student volunteers from Rose Holman to bring to life plans in the Fairbanks Park area which is an incredible asset within our city limits that sits right alongside the Wabash River. Um, they've worked with the Terre Haute Regional Airport and other stakeholders along the East Side Corridor to develop and imp implement signage standards, which will soon be flourishing into a community-wide signage standards um, guide to help really shape all future development in our community. And even though the name of the plan references Terre Haute, regional development has been a key centerpiece of how we plan to grow the community through this plan. Um, our teams have been working to help foster a true West Central business hub or a one-stop shop for anyone wanting to do business in our community. They've engaged a group of regional stakeholders to gather information and create strategies around the all important tenets of talent attraction, retention, and development, which earned us our um, prestigious 21st century talent region designation from the state's Office of Career Connections and Talent. All of this work has occurred alongside our existing regional entity, West Central 2025, which as many of you know, has been engaging leaders in quality of knife initiatives um, from a six county perspective for the past several years. And last but certainly not least, a new community brand was unveiled as part of this effort with CU in Terre Haute which provided a much needed visual centerpiece for visitors and residents alike. And now as some of our tourism related um, developments start to take shape, mainly the um, convention center that is coming along in downtown Terre Haute, along with the remodeling of Holman Center, um, you know, having that brand in place and having these initiatives in place really goes a long way in supporting their overall success. And the plan of the, the work of the community plan isn't stopping there. Um, next on our, our task list is development of a unified development ordinance to guide all future developments in the city and county. Um, a new approach to community-based recovery programming is also in the works that will have lasting implications on our workforce and overall business climate. And this summer, we're going to be launching the first ever Team Vigo Leadership Initiative in cooperation with the Vigo County School Corporation, which will engage 100 high school students in dynamic leadership training that was not only for just 
just this one year, but we'll really help engage them in the community, in those tenets of servant leadership, um, in those general pre you know, premises of, of what it takes to be a leader throughout their entire high school career. And that's just to name a few of the initiatives that we have going. And all of this work has really um, allowed us to set the stage for where we are now and, and the funding we're pursuing through the state's Ready Grant Program, which some affectionately call Regional Cities 2.0. It's an initiative that came out of the 2021 state legislature that provides really critical funding for dynamic, truly community changing regional development. Our application is coming together currently very quickly because um, the legislators, of course, you know, the timeline's kind of tight here, <laughs> but we're making it happen. And it's coming <clears throat> together and we'll focus on workforce development, housing, quality of life, arts and culture, um, and many other areas. Our team, is, which consists of the president of the Wabash Valley Regional Development Authority, Greg Good, along with Thrive West Central's executive director, Ryan Keller, and of course, Senator John Ford when he's wearing his other hat as an employee of Thrive, um, as well as myself as, as a representative of West Central 2025 and our consultant that we're working with, um, Rachel Leslie with RJL Solutions. Uh, the plan's going to include projects from really what we consider our, our typical region, uh, Vigo, Vermilion, Clay, Park, and Sullivan, along with some additional projects from surrounding counties, uh, mainly including Knox and Pike counties. All of these projects are gearing towards one thing, growing our region and taking advantage of this funding opportunity that the state has presented us. So I really want to thank the Indiana Chamber and all of you for joining us today to hear updates on the Chambers, Indiana Chambers Vision 2025 plan. Like I said earlier, um, this plan was really um, helped us shape our initial See You in Terre Haute plan and has continued to help guide us with some great metrics and, and observations throughout the process. Um, really understanding what's happening at the state level from an economic development perspective plays a hugely important part in shaping our individual community plan. <clears throat> So with that kind of laying the groundwork from what was happening locally, I'd now like to turn it over to Kevin um, Brinegar and Adam Berry from the Indiana Chamber, who are going to give us that state perspective along with some individual regional information. So Kevin, take it away. Kristen, thank you very much. And good morning, everyone. And thanks for those kind words. Thanks to our two members of the General Assembly for joining us as well and receiving this um, 2025 report card, our 2021 vision. Um, I've got my fingers crossed. Can you see my screen now? Okay, I see Kristen's head nodding. So um, let me start. Let's see if I can move this. Um, Indiana Vision 2025 is the Chamber's long range economic development action plan for Indiana. And I'm going to move my camera over here. Hopefully that will make me look more like I'm looking at you as I go through these slides on my other screen. Uh, it was developed in 2011 and uh, first released in 2012. It contains 37 goals uh, across what we call four driver areas, which are outstanding talent, uh, attractive business climate, superior infrastructure and dynamic and creative culture. And with this plan, it has been our guiding star for pursuing public policy uh, at the state level, particularly with the General Assembly and with the state administration. And uh, it has helped improve Indiana's business climate and um, really drive Indiana forward to be a leading state in the Midwest and, and the country. And each year, uh, no, excuse me, every other year in the non-election year, we produce a report card that measures our progress has metrics, some uh, 60 metrics that compare our uh, progress over time to the goals that are in the 2025 plan and compares where we rank relative to other states, both with the most recent data, as well as looking back over time. Today, uh, as Kristen indicated, uh, my colleague Adam Berry will be joining me. I will be presenting the state um, data and the national comparisons, 
Adam has some regional metrics. Not all of the metrics go to a sub-state level, but many of them do. And he's going to be sharing data on how the Terre Haute region, uh, West Central Indiana region, compares to uh, the state as a whole. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Adam as well. Uh, he was person in charge of putting together the report card, shepherding the process, working with our economists who gathered and crunched all the numbers, as well as the chamber's uh, communications staff um, to uh, create the look of the, the report card and compile everything into one report. We, uh, as we always do, this is not possible. Uh, the Vision 2025 plan, which is a um, product of the Indiana Chamber Foundation or the Vision 2025 report card without uh, the support that we've received from all these uh, investors in the plan. And we always wanna take every opportunity uh, to thank them as well. And you can see we're blessed to have many, many supporters. So this is the report card cover and you see in the lower uh, right-hand corner, it says May, 2021. Again, we do these every other year. And one of the, the questions and things that I wanna clarify is, this is the 2021 report card, but because of the lag in gathering the data from all the states, particularly by the Census Bureau, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, et cetera, this report card is not impacted and does not include data from 2020. So uh, I've had some folks ask, you know, well, how does the pandemic affect this year's report card? And the answer is it doesn't because of the lag in gathering data. We'll have to deal with that in the next one, the 2023 report card, because then that, that 2020 pandemic uh, data will be included in there, but it is not included uh, in this report card. So let's get started. So start with some food for thought. Um, which matters most? Is it Indiana's current um, scores versus the current national average? Are we above or below the national average? Uh, is our current score versus our scores in previous years, is that most important? Or is it Indiana's how we rank relative to the other 49 states? I would argue that B and C are, are probably more important than, uh, than A, but uh, we can all debate that. So in any of these report cards, we would like to see improvements in our rank uh, and as many metrics as possible. And certainly um, we would like to improve in, in more of the metrics than those that we decline. Uh, but unfortunately that was not the case in this report card. If you look um, down the, in the far right column, you, you see that we improved in 22 metrics, we declined in 26, eight, our ranking was unchanged. And for 14 of the metrics, there was no new data available to make a comparison. Or uh, in a few cases, we added some new metrics uh, that we'll use going forward, but we don't have the data going back. This compares to about the same as the prior, the most recent report card before this one. Um, and uh, so you can see that there's a, a comparison to be made there. Our top uh, 10 rankings. These are the metrics in which we ranked in among the top 10 states um, for our pension uh, stability, our state and local government spending per capita, uh, employment at US affiliates, that's employment at foreign owned companies who have facilities or operations here in Indiana. Um, our NAEP scores have traditionally been strong. This is the National Assessment of Education Progress, which is given at the fourth grade and the eighth grade level to not every student in every state, but to a small sample of students in each state. And we have consistently ranked in the top 15 states in there, although we saw some, as you'll see in a moment, some drop there. Our exports per capita uh, remain strong and um, I think this is particularly important. The reading gap between students that qualify for free and reduced lunch and those who do not, we want that gap to be as small as possible and close. And that's one of the goals in the 2025 plan. You see, we jumped uh, 10 spots from 17th to 10th, and that's a positive number. Now on the flip side, 
here are all of the metrics that we rank in the bottom 10 states. And you'll see the first several of them pertain to the academic achievement of our adult workforce. The percentage of our population that was bachelor's degrees, associate's degrees is in the bottom 10 states. And I believe that this is Indiana's biggest challenge going forward in the future is to lift up the achievement level uh, of our adult workforce so that they possess a degree or an, an industry recognized credential, credential so that they can compete effectively in a 21st century knowledge-based economy. I'll talk about that some more. The other is our health rankings are very poor. You see our smoking rate, uh, we, we improved four, four places, but we're still 40th. And uh, our smoking rate is uh, consistently much higher proportionally than the national average. Per capita income, um, that has been a, a slow slide for several decades. We're now in the bottom 10 states. Uh, there is uh, some other ways to look at that that I'll talk about in a moment. Healthcare costs as measured by the RAND study, which looks at um, the cost of various hospital individual procedures. This is a new metric, but uh, again, we're in the bottom 10. You can see the others, our entrepreneurial index of Kaufman, which is uh, widely recognized across the country. That's an area of concern as well. Turning to um, our raw score. Now, the other chart was our rank. This is how do we, how did we do relative to the score on the same metric two years earlier? A um, little better news here, we improved in 31 metrics. We declined in 20, three were unchanged. And if you compare that to the same chart for the rankings, uh, we only improved in about 20, uh, our rank in about 20 of the metrics, which means that there are a number of metrics where we improved as a state, but not as fast as other states. And so our ranking actually dropped. So that's uh, something to pay close attention to. Let's turn to the individual drivers, uh, starting with outstanding talent. If we read this from left to right. Um, we outperformed the US average in 13 of those metrics, but underperformed in 10. Um, our rankings uh, only uh, improved our rankings in four of the metrics and declined in 10. And um, our raw scores improved in 12, which was encouraging, declined in five. But as you can see, when you compare those to the rankings, we didn't improve as fast as other states in a number of these important metrics. Looking at some of the specifics, our NAEP scores continue to uh, be good in the top 20 and mostly in the top 15 states, but uh, they dropped in all four of these um, categories from the, the prior uh, report card. Public school graduation rates, I always take these with a bit of a grain of salt because even though uh, they're supposed to be using the same methodology across the states, that isn't always the case. And we have um, some exceptions that could get graduation rates with waivers. Um, and we know that there are some school corporations that when a student and their parents come in and say, uh, we're gonna drop out, that the corporation encourages them to say that they're going to homeschool, whether they really are or not. And that allows them not to count that student as a dropout, which in turn raises up the graduation rate. So uh, I personally believe there's some policing that needs to be uh, done there to make sure that we have, that our graduation rate really represents what everybody thinks it does. Post-secondary completion. This is what I was referring to earlier. We have made considerable progress in that first category of any, including certificates. Uh, when we first rolled out uh, the first report card in 2012, Indiana's completion rate was only at 33%. Now we didn't have data at that time on certificates, which add, would have added about five percentage points, uh, but we have still in a very short period of time increased up to 48.3%. That's towards a goal in the plan and the, the goal that the Commission for Education and the Lumina Foundation established of 60% by the year 2025. Um, so we've made good progress, but as you see on the right, we still 
rank 37th in the country. So, and there are countries that are well above um, 50%. If we were at our goal of 60%, we would rank third highest in the country. So this is an area of ongoing emphasis from our view. You see associate's degrees were ranked 40th, 41st rather in bachelor's degrees. This is the percentage of the adult population possessing a bachelor's degrees ranked 40th. Looking at STEM, Indiana ranks perennially in the top 15 states in conferring STEM degrees. That's science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. However, um, the percentage we rank among the bottom states, 10 states uh, in individuals, adult population who actually possess STEM degrees. And I shouldn't say the bottom 10, the bottom third. Uh, the chart on the right is the uh, percentage of residents with a STEM degree. The chart on the left is those who hold uh, STEM related jobs. So we need to do, uh, and there are a lot of efforts underway to keep those students who earn the STEM degrees at our colleges and universities um, and get them to stay here in Indiana after graduation. Outstanding talent per capita personal income. As I mentioned, this has been a downward slide for several decades in our ranking among the 50 states uh, and similarly with household income, but that doesn't tell the whole story. And so um, I re requested the staff of about two report cards back also look at adjusting that data for the cost of living because it costs far less to live in Indiana and your, your income goes much farther than it does in a number of other states, particularly on the East Coast and the West Coast. So when you adjust for the differences in cost of living, um, our per capita personal income and our household income ranks much better, more in the middle of the pack at 24th on personal and 23rd on household. Switching to attractive business climate, driver number two, uh, we outperformed the US average in six metrics, underperformed in seven. We improved our ranking in seven of the metrics, uh, only declined in four, and similarly, the same outcome with our raw scores. Uh, we have achieved four of the goals. Some of the goals in this area are what I call binary. You either achieve them or you don't. Uh, that includes things like eliminating the inheritance tax, which has already happened, and becoming a right to work state, which has already happened, which is one of the goals in the 2025 plan. Uh, just a chart to remind us that we have far too many units of local government. We do not need 289 school districts, but particularly when over half of them, 54%, have fewer than 2,000 students in all of K through 12, and 20% have fewer than 1,000 students in all of K through 12. Many of those school, very small school districts um, can't, don't have the, the, the um, number of students needed to even offer STEM courses. So how can we expect them, those students to pursue STEM careers if they're not exposed to physics and chemistry and calculus in their high schools? Our healthy rankings under this driver include these areas, and we have a number of them. But we have some rankings in the, the attractive business climate area that are very poor, particularly with respect to our health metrics. Hoosiers are relatively, comparatively unhealthy. And the, the cartoon in the upper right-hand corner kind of sums it up. Uh, but it's also documented in our health insurance premiums, our 31st lowest, and have uh, jumped considerably since the last report card. I mentioned the RAND study on hospital uh, procedural costs, 303% more than Medicare for the same services. <clears throat> and then obesity, 39th. Um, that's a big jump from uh, the previous report card. Smoking at 40th, which consistently is ranked about 50% higher than the national average. Going to superior infrastructure, driver number three. Uh, again, we, we only outperformed the US average in two metrics uh, behind in seven. Um, similar on the uh, rankings, improved in three, declined in four. Our raw scores improved in three, only three and de declined in three. Um, again, progress towards the goals 
um, two of the goals in the plan uh, we think may be completely out of reach. <clears throat> One of the things we're watching and people have commented about considerably is electricity prices. The turn of the century, um, our uh, average prices for electricity were fifth lowest in the country. Uh, they're now uh, above uh, average, but there is a, a rest of the story to be told. And that uh, comes from our energy study that the Chamber Foundation produced last fall, which showed that public utilities and, and other municipal utilities in Indiana have made considerable investments in renewables and in emission controls uh, at a greater rate than other states. And our study predicts that as other states have to catch up and make these investments, um, our rank on prices will improve as they make those investments. But we're gonna be watching that over the next decade. Broadband, uh, we rank well on speeds. Uh, we've been up and down on um, access, but we're very encouraged by the investment and very grateful for the investment the General Assembly has made in helping to make broadband available uh, throughout the state, as well as the uh, federal money that is coming directly for broadband. So we should see good improvements between now and the next report card two years from now. Finally, driver number four. Uh, attractive uh, and dynamic and creative culture. Um, there, we're below the US average and more of the metrics than, than above. Uh, we've seen an even split on our rankings and those that improved and those that declined. And similarly with our raw scores. We continue to make progress towards many of the goals in this area. Um, but again, there will be a couple that are difficult to achieve because they were very ambitious goals in the first place. Looking at net job creations by firms six years and older, two years ago, we ranked fifth highest in the country in creating jobs among our older companies, uh, but we ranked 45th in the companies five years and under. That ranking has improved uh, in the past two years, but we still uh, have a reason for concern there, particularly when you add to this, uh, the number of new entrepreneurs, new businesses being created are not occurring at a rate as fast as is occurring in other states. Venture capital, we have seen improvement there. Um, two sessions ago, the General Assembly made the venture capital tax credit transferable. This session uh, did a very important thing and we thank you by um, ex expanding the cap, the amount of credits that could be uh, provided each year from 12 million to 20 million, and also uh, increasing the percentage of the cap to 20%. And for women and minority owned businesses, that uh, percentage is 30%. The chart uh, here, the, the data show that we've increased our venture capital per worker, but not as fast as uh, other states have in this, when using the US media. Employment and majority owned US affiliates, Indiana continues to be an attractive place for foreign investment to put plant and facilities in. Think uh, Honda, Toyota, Subaru. Um, we have a, large, a much higher uh, level of employment at foreign owned companies who have facilities in our state than uh, nearly every other state in the country. Our key takeaways, um, going back to outstanding talent, uh, our college readiness has improved. The percentage of students requiring remediation when they get to college has decreased significantly. That relates also to the uh, increasing GPA among high school seniors and um, adult education attainment is improving. Concerns, opportunities, uh, again, per capita personal income. We need to be creating more good paying jobs. And to do that, we have to lift up the skills of our adult workforce so that they can command and, and fill those jobs and close the skills gap that exists in Indiana. Attractive business climate, uh, again, mission accomplished on four of the goals. Our um, economic liberty index is very positive. The opportunities, not surprisingly, are healthcare costs and outcomes. And uh, we didn't show the chart, but our ranking on our legal environment, particularly for business purposes, has dropped down to 31st, 
We take that with a little bit of a grain of salt though, because that metric is based on a survey of corporate general counsels from across the country. So it's a subjective um, data, not, not a, we, don't, we can't find a hard uh, objective piece of data to evaluate Indiana to other states. Superior infrastructure, uh, broadband is improving. We know we've made significant investments in our roads and bridges. And we think that that has not fully shown up uh, in terms of the uh, major infrastructure package the General Assembly passed in 2017 is not fully incorporated into this data yet. We expect it will be uh, in the next report card. And certainly anywhere you go in Indiana, you see uh, construction activity going on. One thing we're gonna continue to watch is how do our uh, energy prices and the movement towards uh, renewables and um, uh, the decommissioning of coal-fired plants Im impact our electricity prices relative to other states. And then lastly, dynamic and creative culture. Uh, we've seen improvements in venture capital in part, in large part because of the um, making, the General Assembly making the venture capital tax credit more attractive. Um, in migration, Indiana has seen positive net in migration for three consecutive years. That's a lot about what the ready grants are about is providing uh, regionals, regions, excuse me, across the state to develop quality of place initiatives to make their regions more attractive to others. There is an intense competition for um, a talent uh, going on across the country uh, as we have kind of a population challenge facing us going forward. Opportunities, uh, net, net job growth at our younger and even our older firms and uh, population workforce challenges, making sure that we have enough workers to fill the job so that our, our business growth and our economic expansion is not hindered by the lack of individuals. Uh, I saw a ranking uh, last week of the 50 states of how many jobs were available and how many people were available to fill those jobs. And Indiana's rank was literally almost one to one. There were 155,000 uh, unemployed folks available and there were 150,000 job openings. That ranked us, uh, that ratio was 47th lowest in the country. And none of the states had a real positive um, differential between workers available and um, jobs of, uh, openings, but uh, ours was literally right at almost one-to-one. -one. Adam, let me uh, stop there again. We thank our, our sponsors and um, let you switch over and share your screen on the regional data. Can you see that okay? I can. Great. Uh, well, as Kevin mentioned, my name is Adam Berry. I'm Vice President of Economic Development and Technology here at the Chamber. Um, Mostly, I, I work on the lobbying and policy development, uh, but I also, uh, as Kevin probably gave me too much credit at the top, uh, work on Indiana Vision 2025 and specifically the report card. And just quick, quickly, uh, anecdotal, it's kind of as a professional full circle for me, because um, my relationship with Indiana Vision 2025 dates back to 2012, when it was just released, and I was then working on uh, Congressman Pence's uh, campaign, and we used much of the of the data and the goals uh, to, that for his purposes of his uh, campaign agenda and ultimately his, his governing agenda. Uh, so it's a, like I said, it's a sort of a professional full circle. And, um, but, uh, you know, today we're here talking about uh, West Central Indiana and the region. And the way that we, um, and first, Kristen, thank you, uh, Terre Haute Chamber um, and the legislators that have joined us today. I really look forward to hearing your commentary. Um, but so we, we, we uh, appreciate the relationship. And, but when we talk about you know, how we want to sort of evaluate Indiana's progress, um, we think it's important to look uh, at, at, at regions of the state. And there are many different uh, regional development authorities and different sort of groups. So just for consistency purposes, the way that we've broken up these metrics in, in evaluation um, at, at the regional level is, is looking at the way that DWD breaks up 
uh, its workforce region. So today we're talking about uh, workforce region uh, seven, which includes the six counties uh, you, you see here on, on this slide. Um, and as Kevin mentioned, we can't extrapolate all of the different metrics at the local level, uh, but I'm gonna go through, I think it's 11 of them uh, that we are able to sort of pull, pull those at, at the local level. So let's start with high school graduation rate. Um, and just quickly, so the color coding that you're gonna see uh, where the number is red, that means that the progress or decline uh, underperformed the state's progress. Uh, where it's green, it means that uh, the region outperformed. So here you can see that the high school graduation rate, while it improved to 87%, uh, it in, that improvement was 3.9% versus uh, the uh, graduation rate in, in 2019, in the 2019 uh, report card versus the state's improvement of 4.1%. Uh, now, the good note uh, that wasn't mentioned is that 44% uh, of high school seniors graduate with above a 3.0 GPA, which is the highest portion of graduating uh, seniors in the last five years. Uh, and only 1% required remediation in math uh, and reading, which was 11% a uh, decade ago. So still uh, good stories to tell here in terms of public high school graduation. Uh, associate's degree, you'll see that your region, uh, it, the number is green because the region improved by 1.4% uh, here versus the, the state remaining flat. Uh, so while it's uh, the, 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 the portion of the adult population with an associate's degree is significantly less than the state, there was still improvement where there was not uh, a statewide basis. Uh, similarly, with, a, with bachelor's degree, the region improved by 2% versus the state's 1% uh, improvement. Uh, science and engineering degrees, this is, I think, you know, it, it might not look, a jump from 7.7 to 8.4% might at first not seem like a lot, but that's a 9% uh, improvement in the region. Uh, versus the state uh, uh, state growth being flat. So I think if there is really a sort of a high point of my presentation about regional metrics, this would probably be it. Uh, less than a high school diploma, um, the, the por so this is the portion of your population uh, that ha who have less than high school diploma. Um, and while uh, that number did decrease. It decreased by 4.6%, uh, or I guess improved by 4.6% versus the state improvement of 4.8%. So pretty consistent with the state. In terms of poverty ranking, again, you want to see a lower number here. Uh, the region's poverty rate declined by 6%, uh, but the state's uh, versus the state as a whole declining by 8.9%. Uh, Per capita income, uh, the region improved by 9.4%, which is which exactly mirrors the, the state's 9.4% uh, uh, increase in, in per capita income. Adult smoking rate, this is, if I, I mentioned the high point of, the, of my presentation, this is certainly um, a low point. Uh, whereas the state smoking rate declined, uh, sort of dipped under 20%, uh, for the first time and uh, since we started keeping score, the region's smoking rate increased by 18 and a half percent, which, uh, you know, as we all know, the, the implications of smoking in a state, uh, Kevin often cites a statistic of costing employers six and a half billion dollars annually in terms of loss production, uh, insurance premiums, etc. Here, the obesity rate in the West Central region swelled by five and a half percent versus the state bloating up by 5.1%. Uh, so again, this is sort of moving in the wrong direction. The drug deaths in, in, in the West Central region, this is actually another sort of, again, um, you know, sort of a bright spot, if you will. Uh, while the region did not decline uh, at the same rate as the state, it did decline, which is not consistent from region to region. There were actually many regions where this drug death rate um, uh, ticked up. So uh, not only did your region decline in this metric, uh, but the rate of drug deaths in your region 
is, is more than 40% less than the state as a whole. So again, kudos there. And then that domestic migration, and you know, I remember two years ago uh, uh, sharing this, this metric with the, with the group. Uh, I, 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 I have another slide that I'm gonna show. It kind of breaks it down by county. Uh, there is obviously a decline in the region, but Kristen did a very nice job at the top sort of laying out all of the initiatives that are going on uh, in the West Central region. Um, I personally enjoy visiting uh, Terre Haute in West Central Indiana. Uh, it, it's dramatic changes over the last 10, 20 years. Um, and uh, so even though the, the numbers here sort of don't, again, kind of like Kevin, don't tell the full story, the rest of the story, um, that I, I think that you know, you you're making the right investments and sort of taking the right approach and keeping that focus on investing in, in what is going to make your region uh, uh, more attractive, not only to uh, attract talent, but also retain residents. And then finally, just sort of at a high level, what we, what we observe, I mean, it's so hard to compare regions across the state to each other. I mean, and while there are things that are similar, you know, advanced manufacturing in every region, every region has its own uh, sort of strengths and challenges. But if you just look at comparing a region to itself, uh, what we saw is that in terms of human capital and income, there's you know, a trend in the right direction, a uh, negative trend in terms of smoking, obesity, and drug deaths. Um, and then in terms of in-migration and out-migration, it's, it's it really you have to look at it county by county. Uh, and so I've listed here some of the counties that are attracting the most uh, and also losing the most in terms of population. And then finally, I, I just want to thank again our sponsors, our investors, uh, and uh, Terre Haute Chamber for partnering with us and again, our legislators. And again, I really am looking forward to hearing uh, your reaction and input uh, for your vision for the state and the region going forward. So thank you. Adam, Kevin, thanks to both of you. Um, I, I think I could speak for all of us when I say that those numbers are uh, some of them are a little shocking, a little bit hard to face. However, they're not surprising necessarily. I think that these are things that we have been seeing and feeling through our own data tracking efforts and, and just anecdotally as well. But um, thank you for your compliments, Adam. I, I do feel very strongly that we as a community and as a region are coming together to really change the trajectory on some of those negatives and, and continue to build on those positives. So I, I, I'm very optimistic um, despite some of the challenges challenges that we have to face. So before we go any farther, I did want to give our legislators who have graciously joined us this morning a, a moment to, to comment or offer any thoughts on some of the information that they've seen today. I, I know it's a lot to process in a short period of time, um, but I am interested in hearing your general reaction. So I'll turn it over to Senator Ford first, if you don't mind. Anything you'd like to, to add or, or comment on? Well, thank you, Kristen, and, and thank you to Kevin and Adam for uh, taking the time to uh, talk to our leaders in our region. Um, yeah, I mean, I would echo Kristen's uh, comments. I mean, a lot of momentum in our community. We're working on a lot of these issues. You know, I think to see our drug deaths um, lower than the state average really, I think, pays tribute to what we've been working on as a community to take the stigma of drug addiction. We've worked hard on that and a lot of different partners. So it's great to see that statistic uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in black and white and, and that you've been able to research that. But we certainly know that uh, we have a lot to work on. And uh, I think we have a great uh, community set of community leaders working towards a lot of those things. Um, certainly, you know, I think your statistics really show what a lot of us talk about that people are our number one commodity and that we need to continue to work on the attraction and, and retention of our talent, you know, especially I think that one statistic um, that showed the number of people in engineering and science, right? We're a community with four universities. So we need to continue to work on keeping that, those brains in our community because those universities are attracting them we've got to work on keeping them. And I know overall Indiana has to also work on that. But, you know, workforce development is something that we're, we're working on. I think, you know, the 
adult education certainly is something that we need to work on um, and that we are working on. Same with early learning. You know, I think COVID showed us that there's some weaknesses across the state and certainly in our region on uh, early learning and childcare uh, and, and population health. I know, uh, I think uh, Steve Holman was on the call earlier, not sure if he's still on, but I know he's leading a group that really is looking at population health and what we can do. But it, um, you know, I do again to, to sum up, I think we're really working hard towards these metrics that you have set forth. And I think it's great to review these uh, every so often. And I know I look at these quite a bit and appreciate the Indiana Chamber spending the time to do this. Thank you. Representative Path, would you like to add any, any comments or context to this uh, discussion? Absolutely, thank you so much for uh, the presentation. I'm a numbers person. So, you know, you sit there and you look at those numbers and you're like, wow, okay. I knew that was good. I knew that was bad. And so many of the uh, decisions that both John and I make affect um, our local community. And I think that's what people don't really get sometimes. Um, the one, you know, the smoking pops out in my head about, I know that was a big indie chamber fight was to uh, raise the cigarette tax. And um, uh, we did in a very, very, very um, small way, unfortunately. But, you know, just the effects on what we do in the state house really affect our communities. And I think our community has so much potential. And just like John said, we're getting there. But I'm gonna kind of shift my focus a little bit to my other hat, which is as a high school math teacher. And I was kind of jotting down like three things that I think that perhaps um, we, we could do better in, how's that? So um, the first one is uh, internships. So a lot of high school kids just have no idea what's out there. And you know, we have, we have such great, higher education institutes in, in our community. Ivy Tech does such a great job, ISU, Rose Holman, St. Mary's, but the kids just don't know what's available. So if we could kind of boost up our internship program in Vigo County School Corporation and all over the state. So for example, one of my daughters had an internship she took the semester during high school, two hours she leaves during the day. Well, there's no she had to go find her own internship. She had to go seek out something and try to figure out, you know, call them themselves. I think that our community could do a better job of exploring possibilities, be it at the, um, you know, in welding or it, at, the, uh, at the Chamber of Commerce, whatever. You know, there's just so many possibilities for internships. And, and again, that gives high school kids an opportunity to see that there's other things besides being a teacher, a nurse, whatever. Uh, the second is career counseling. Again, I have a senior in high school um, and I'm like, what do you wanna be? And she's like, I have no idea. I said, but you picked a career path. So now we have a career path in high school that you have to pick. But the counseling, you know, each counselor has about 300 students. It lasts about five minutes. They just don't have the time to help a, a high school kid delve into, again, possibilities. And to me, the chamber does a great job of, of you know, spreading its message. But if you're in high school, you really don't have many ideas on what you can be. And the, the third thing um, is I fought for was CTE funding uh, at the state level. They were trying to cut, well, at least they're maintaining it. But again, those hands-on classes, that's what I call them because I'm old, but you know, the more we can get students into taking uh, welding, woodworking, auto body, auto mechanic, you know, those classes, cooking, hairdressing, you know, that's our workforce, right? That's part of our workforce. So the more we can, again, this is my high school math teacher uh, hat, the more we can explore those possibilities when they're younger, um, I think the better our state would be off. Because, you know, to me, the key to economic development is, is all about education. So, you know, get them young, get them excited, and then head them off to either Ivy Tech, ISU, St. Mary's Rose Holman, and then retain them in our community. Because the jobs are here, we just need the job workforce. So I think that's about it, if that's all right. Yeah. And if I might um, jump in here and, and, yeah. and comment on uh, the uh, exposure and in the internship or work and learn type exposure for 
or high school kids, um, we're working on something that's uh, at least a partial solution. And that is uh, for a number of years now, the Indiana Chamber has run a program for college students called Indiana Internet. We're now changing the name to Work and Learn Indiana. And that's gonna move into the high school space as well because uh, the students that just finished their sophomore year in high school this year will be required to have a work and learn experience uh, as a criteria for graduation under the Graduation Pathways Program the General Assembly um, uh, enacted several years ago. And so through uh, this web-based matching system that we have um, that has uh, produced over 11,000 confirmed college internships over the last number of years, we're gonna move that down into the high school space and do all we can to make businesses aware of these opportunities and the fact that there are kids in their communities who have this now have this requirement um, and uh, encourage those businesses and teach them how to provide uh, quality, meaningful work and learn experiences for the high school students as well. You know, that, that sounds great that just the more exposure to different things, uh, I mean, maybe we should just start making TikTok videos and, and <laughs> get the word out. But, you know, the more that we can expose, you know, our students to opportunities, the, the better off we all are. That sounds like a great program. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'd be happy to send you some information on it as well. Yeah, please do. Thank you. We'll follow up. Kevin, I'm glad you mentioned that program. Um, you know, I think Indiana Internet, but I'm getting closer to being able to say Work Learn Indiana. We're still struggling basis. too, so don't feel bad. <laughs> um, I, it's an incredible program, and, and some of you may not know this, but Lori Danielson um, does serve in a leadership capacity mm -hmm. with that group, and so yeah. has been really great about sharing information um, with us, with the chamber, as well as the local community, and, and we have some great ideas on some ways that we could integrate a little bit better and make sure that um, employers are aware of that incredible resource in the community, um, especially given the changes you all have been making with the program. So thanks for mentioning that. I, I did want to share one other um, small piece of data. And I, I see um, Leanne Kirks, who's chancellor of our local Ivy Tech um, on the call with us today. And so hopefully she won't be mad at me for going ahead and sharing this because we haven't fully vetted it out. But we kind of did a, a quick survey of graduating um, students from the Vigo County School Corporation. We had 322 responses, um, not, not everybody, but we, we felt like we got a pretty good cross sampling. And we'd asked a few questions. And one of those was, in five years, do you intend to be living in West Central Indiana? And we define that as the region that Adam was talking about earlier. Um, and it was kind of interesting to see that 24% of students responded that they were planning to move out of the state. 27% percent said that yes they did intend to be living here um six percent said they didn't intend to be in our region but they planned to stay within indiana and then the big number for me was 41 percent said that they were not sure um which I, I know we're dealing with you know graduating seniors and it's a little bit hard to, to nail things down a lot of times but that number those numbers did show to me that there is an incredible opportunity for that engagement like representative path was talking about and making sure that kids understand the opportunities that are available here in our own region and what they can take advantage of by staying here and telling that story. So those are some initiatives that we're working on to, to kind of help change the trajectory of that number a little bit. Um, with that, I would open it up to anybody else on the call who might have questions for the panelists. And I, I know a few of our individuals on the call need to jump off at some point here to attend to other things, so feel free. Um, but if you do have a question, I think we're a small enough group, you don't have to worry about the chat, feel free to, to chime in. Hi, Kristen. This is uh, Desharian from WTWO. Hi, Desharian. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Um, so my question for the panel, you know, I know a lot of things were discussed as far as education and, you know, making sure that the next generation has the opportunity to get those jobs. With that being said, when you were speaking about, you know, the net population going down, for the, uh, for the panel, what are some of the key factors that they think will drive population up? Kevin, Adam, would either of you like to, to tackle this question from one of our local news stations? Um, I'll go first. Uh, 
I think the um, the quality of place initiatives that um, the uh, folks in the region, the municipalities, the economic development uh, folks are putting together for your ready grant, I think is very important um, for talent attraction. Um, as I recall, this region did not get to participate in the original regional cities. Uh, there were it was kind of a winner take all approach back then. And there were three regions of the state that were, that were chosen. Uh, I think the, the good thing about the, the ready grant program is that any and every region in the state can make application, can come together on um, projects and, and initiatives <clears throat> of regional significance, multi-jurisdictional um, focus on quality of place on being able to retain and attract uh, talented people that you have uh, in your region and to come into your region. And that's, that's kind of the whole underlying principle. Um, so I think that'll be important. I think uh, efforts to hang on to those graduates, whether it's four year people earning four year degrees, associate's degrees at Ivy Tech or various certificates and certifications uh, that um, the employers in your region so desperately need. Yeah, so I'll, I don't necessarily have the data to back this up. So this is just kind of very speaking anecdotally here. Um, you know, I'm from Evansville. Uh, and for me, the big city was Indianapolis or Chicago. Um, I think that there are, there's a huge population in rural Illinois or rural Missouri or wherever, where Terre Haute might be the big city. Uh, for, for those folks. And so marketing, marketing the strengths of the region and recruiting and trying to attract that talent, uh, I think is, is an opportunity to grow the region. Um, you know, uh, and again, I think it's also, you know, we lose such a high percentage of our college graduates. I, I, you know, I think that that um, you know, working on retaining the talent as much as attracting. Uh, and, and then finally, being on the border of Illinois, I mean, we heard, I, I worked on a piece of legislation uh, this year to uh, retract remote workers, attract, attract remote workers to the state. And uh, I was working with Representative Carbell on that, on that legislation, and he was contacted separately uh, by two CDL drivers uh, in Illinois that essentially said, if Indiana will recognize my CDL uh, commercial driver's license, uh, instead of you know, me moving to Indiana, trying to invest in, in moving my family to Indiana, and then having to take this uh, skills exam where I have to parallel park my, my trailer, which I never have to do, um, but if Indiana will recognize my license, my family and I will move to Indiana tomorrow. Um, it, and so I think looking for opportunities to reduce the barrier of entry into professional uh, uh, occupations uh, is another opportunity for this at the state level uh, to help make that move to Indiana uh, more attractive. Those are really good points, Adam. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that. We were certainly following along with um, the legislation that you mentioned, given our um, very close proximity to Illinois and knowing that we are kind of a, um, a you know, a, a center for a lot of those folks in, in downstate Illinois who live in rural areas, um, head over and, and eat at our restaurants and shop at our retailers and, and those kinds of things. So, you know, we're always interested in, in those kinds of efforts and we'll continue um, to think about those as we move into our next legislative session. Okay, anybody else have comments or questions? It's always hard with Zoom. You never know if somebody's trying to unmute, can't quite get it accomplished. <laughs> hey, Kristen, this is Bob Gruy. Hey, Bob. Uh, I've been up here four years and, and I will say, you know, the last couple of years, I think there's really been a a purposeful effort to, to, to put a new face on, on Terre Haute Vigo County. 
and and I hope that we can continue those investments because they're they they, they are paying off, I believe. Uh, and a lot of it is the soft stuff about code happenings and just being able to to tell people and celebrate there's there's cool things going on. Um, but the, the other curiosity I have is a region is is just so different. I mean, every county really has a different feel and look and uh, values maybe and interest. And I was curious if, uh, you know, the panel maybe has some insights as to maybe how we kind of come together a little closer or, or even just share an understanding that we're all in different places, but we have a common interest. I think that's a really good question, Bob. And if, if you don't mind, I'm going to respond a little bit first. Um, I, I think that, you know, when I think back to where we were four or five years ago, when we really started talking regionally, probably prompted by Regional Cities version mm -hmm. one, um, we have come leaps and bounds. And while it is not perfect, um, and probably if we're be all being honest with each other, no region across the state can say that it's perfect because it's challenging relationships. Um, but we have come so far. And, and I think the areas where we've really been able to connect, Bob, and I know you can attest to this, are a lot of those quality of life pieces that we've talked about. Um, you know, what Park County brings to the table in terms of having their, their downtown square and there, um, you know, cute little boutiques and, and, and neat little antique stores, those kinds of things, you know, really brings a, a different set of skills or amenities to the table than some of the other counties bring, but it all has to kind of come together to create that whole West Central Indiana approach. Um, so, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm really optimistic about all the work we've achieved and, and really feel good about where we are going into not just this ready grant, but, um, you know, in, in, in general, all sorts of regional initiatives. Um, but I'd be curious to see what, what Kevin and Adam might add in terms of, you know, things they've seen from around the state. Well, I think we are gradually breaking down um, barriers and increasingly thinking more regional, regionally. Regional cities has helped um, cause that. I've, I've talked to some um, uh, local chamber executives and, and others in areas of the state that did not uh, receive any of the first round um, regional cities funding. And they said that just the going through the exercise of putting our proposal together and getting together and sitting down and talking about what are the priorities, what would be the, <clears throat> the game changers for our regions um, was a useful exercise. And they, they said that those conversations are continuing that might not have ever happened, but for um, the exercise that they went through to put that first proposal together and I, I have to believe that that's going to, um, I'll use the word blossom even further um, with the ready program because uh, it's not a winner take all program for just a, two or three uh, regions of the state, but every state, every state, excuse me, every region can put together uh, their proposal. They can attract matching money and, um, you know, and, and there's a group at the IEDC that's going to evaluate these proposals and, and say yes or no. But I think this will further that uh, even beyond and, and break down some of these um, or really artificial um, government boundaries uh, and get folks to think that, you know, okay, the, the plant may go or the, the investment may go over, you know, in this city or this town or this county but uh, all of us in the region are going to benefit from that because of the employment um, and the, the shopping that the employees will do and, and all those synergistic kinds of things. Yeah, so I, uh, I guess to answer the question, I, I, would, view it, <clears throat> I, would, view, I would view it as an opportunity. Um, and borrowing from uh, Tara Barney, who is the co-CEO of now what's called EREP, uh, Evansville Regional Economic Partnership, uh, she sort of explained the evolution of, of the consolidation of the different groups down in Southwest Indiana and why they chose the name 
uh, EREP, when it's supposed to represent four counties, four or five counties in Southwest Indiana, as well as Henderson and Kentucky, what she said is that, you know, we wanted to, we wanted to include Evansville because there's no getting around the fact that Evansville is sort of the uh, urban center of that region. And so when you say Evansville Regional Economic Partnership to someone out from outside the state or from around the state, they immediately know uh, the community that you're talking about. Now, just because they have the name Evansville Regional Economic Partnership does not mean that they cannot market uh, the other counties and the benefits and the opportunities and the strengths uh, in your Posey County uh, or Warwick County. I mean, each county, each geographic area around Evansville brings something to the table. And so while and in a previous life, I, I own my own business, so I understand the importance of branding and marketing. And so when someone hears the name of your region, they want, you, they, you, they want to associate it with a brand and a sort of a feeling. Um, and you can do that by sort of highlighting all the strengths in that region uh, in, in the county um, and not just focusing on, on one particular uh, city or municipality, um, but highlighting the strengths of the, of the region as a whole, but with a singular sort of brand if that, if that sort of uh, answers your question, Bob, I, I hope it did. Thanks all, yes. Any other questions or comments before we close things out? Hey, Chris, and this is Sherry, and I just had one last question for the panel. Sure. Um, so I, I know a lot of things were discussed, but you know, just for this specific region, what do you think the next steps are uh, for the regional economic development? Sure. So I think right now, as I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the big steps we're working on is that ready grant process and um, identifying some really key projects that can help move our region forward in terms of some of those areas I mentioned earlier, workforce, housing, quality of life, arts and culture, all of those areas. And, and really that all gets back to that key tenant of, of attract, attracting and retaining talent. Uh, so I think that's one of the, the next big steps. But beyond that, um, I think that what uh, Bob and Adam were just kind of discussing a little bit in terms of regional marketing approach and, and really you know, continuing to break down those barriers and, and come together uh, to put our best foot forward, so to speak, as an entire region, not just a county, it is something we have to continue to work on. Anyone else? I don't see anything in the chat. I don't see anybody waving their hands wildly or trying to unmute. So I think we may have reached the end of our conversation. So I, I would, did want to ask though, um, Kevin and Adam, would it be possible to share your presentation um, with me so I might be able to forward to all of these individuals? Um, there were a lot of numbers and data and uh, I've already had a couple of text requests <laughs> to, okay. to have that sent here our way. So that'd be great if you could do that. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> we'll, we'll send you the link uh, to the report card itself as well. Great, great. Thank you. Well, again, I appreciate you all taking the time. Uh, Kevin, Adam, any final remarks before we close things out? No, again, I just want to thank Representative Half and, and Senator Ford for joining us today. Thank you, Kristen. Um, you know, I, I see a lot of um, Shelley's on, on the call and a lot of folks who care deeply about your region and the state as a whole, um, you know, Talking about data is not always the sexiest conversation. So uh, those who, who did tune in, I appreciate your interest and uh, feel free to reach out anytime with, with questions. Um, uh, I'm always available to help. I would echo Adam's remarks and also say that um, we certainly see a number of good things going on in this region. And I think it's, it's on the move. And um, I think you're well on your way to reversing that population trend, which I think is, is a really important metric to focus on. And I'm, I'm glad to see that it is one indeed that you are focusing on. So uh, congratulations on that. And thanks everyone for joining us today. 
Thank you all. We appreciate your time. Like I said, we'll be following up with um, those links that will be provided by the Indiana Chamber so you all can take a little bit of a deeper look at this. So thank you all again for joining us today. Um, go out and enjoy the rest of your day in this nice weather before it starts raining again the rest of the week. <laughs> all right. Thanks. Thanks all.